OK, so hello, everyone, again. Um, so I want to continue. So I have now two lectures, it's luckily separated by a coffee break. OK, so I will continue for this second lecture with a magic angle refrain and more recent developments. Okay, the story that I told you yesterday was basically the things that we published, uh, you know, the discovery last year. And then on the third lecture, I will switch a little bit topics and I will uh, go a bit deeper into topology and in other two-dimensional materials than, than graphene. So just as a reminder about what I told you yesterday, so magic angle twisted by layer graphene, okay, you have the two data cones from the two graphene sheets in momentum space. If you get them close to each other due to the interlayer tunneling, you have here a band splitting. Okay? If this interlayer tunneling is of the same order as that the height of that crossing point, then you go into this flat band condition. And this occurs you know, at an angle called the magic angle. This magic angle is dependent on what is that interlayer tunneling. Okay? If it increases, the magic angle is a different angle. If it decreases, again, it's a different angle. And this was you know, theoretically predicted, and there were already some interesting STM experiments. So just you know, so that you, you know, for some of the things I'm going to say, I think it's useful that you watch this video again. Okay? Just remember this energy versus momentum for large twist angle, like three degrees in this case within this energy window. This looks like graphene, essentially, even though it's twisted by layer graphene. And as you rotate towards smaller angles, you see that the brilliance on decreases, and then the energy bands get massively reconstructed. Gaps here, you have this set of flat bands which come very flat at about 1.05, 101, you know, uh, sorry, 1.1105 degrees. Yeah? Then you get, you know, including lattice relaxation, this is more or less the angle, and this is the, you know, the basic physics that I told you about yesterday, okay? What happens when we put the Fermi energy in that flat band? You get correlated insulator behavior, superconductivity, et cetera. Yeah? So let's go back for a moment and think about in terms of the phase diagram, okay? because you're going to see how this phase diagram, which for graphene is very simple, becomes more and more complex as we go towards higher and higher quality devices. So this is the phase di diagram of graphene, also large angle twisted by layer graphene. Okay? The electronic structure consists of these Dirac cones. There is only in temperature versus density, okay? where density, here density for, for graphene doesn't mean too much. For twisted value graphene, you know it means the number of electrons or holes per mole unit cell. There is only one interesting point, it's charge neutrality, the Dirac point. Something happens there. In transport, you have a resistance maximum, but nothing else happens. Okay? The, the system is a metal everywhere, including the neutrality point. Now, what happens if you go to small twist angle but not yet magic. Remember, we have now this energy reconstruction of the bands, okay, this super lattice bands. You get a set of flattish bands separated from gaps from the more dispersive bands, okay, or remote bands, sometimes they're called. So you still have a charge neutrality point which exhibits, you know, Dirac behavior because of the graphene Dirac cones there. But now at four electrons or four holes per more unit cell, you develop an insulator, a band insulator, okay? Because you have these gaps, these single particle gaps, okay? as I mentioned yesterday. This is something that we observed already a number of years ago, and it has been observed by you know, many other groups since then also. Okay? Band insulator behavior. Now, if you go to magic angle graphene, this is the phase diagram. This is schematic, and as of last summer, more or less, okay? So you have, you know, I'm now exploring in my density axis or filling, filling factor, okay? Not filling factor like in quantum hole. I'm calling here filling new, the number of electrons or holes per more unit cell. So around, you know, again, four and minus four, you have those large gaps. So you have band insulators. At charge neutrality, you still have Dirac behavior, okay? And, you know, we thought we had a metal here. At low temperatures, correlated insulators appear at two electrons or two holes per more unit cell. And then I showed you yesterday that if you dope a little bit with electrons, with extra holes, or with electrons around the correlated insulator state for holes, you have superconducting domes. It turns out 
By the summer, we had observed, and another group later also, I mean, actually the other group reported it first, but we had observed it already, and I had shown it in talks, that you also have superconducting domes around the correlated insulator state for electrons when you add extra electrons or you add extra holes. Yeah? So you have four domes. And as I mentioned, there was also related correlated insulator work on ABC triangular graphene on HBN. So this was as of mid-2018. Okay? And again, the phenomenology was this correlated insulator behaviors and superconductivity. So as of late 2018, and it is evolving very fast, it has evolved, in fact, very fast during the first six months of you know, 2019, this is the phase diagram, and I, I'm going to show the, 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 the one from you know, last summer, and I'm going to add things to it. This is, again, you shouldn't look too much into the details. This is a schematic. It is twist angle dependent. It depends on certain boundary conditions on the samples. But just to give you an idea of the phenomenology that we're observing in this system. Yeah? The first thing that we notice is that in this region around the correlated insulator state, there seems to be linear in temperature resistivity over a very large temperature range from very, very small temperatures all the way to the Fermi temperature. Okay? This is phenomenology which is very similar to the strange metal behavior in correlated systems. Okay? While near you know, charge neutrality, the system continues to be a regular metal without linear resistivity behavior. Something that we have also seen is that the superconducting state is pneumatic. It exhibits a breaking of lattice rotational symmetry. Okay? And this is something that I will tell you a little bit more about today. We also see signatures of competing orders. It's not just superconductivity. There seems to be other orders which are competing with superconductivity around you know, the regions near optimal doping. And we also see signatures of nematicity in the normal state. You know, seeing nematicity in the superconducting state and the normal state are different things. Okay? And again, I will go a little bit over all of these things in, in the rest of my talk. Now, I'm only going to mention briefly, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but by now, a lot of people, including ourselves, have seen also that interesting physics, interesting stuff happens, not only when you put two electrons or two holes per more unit cell, but when you put one or three electrons or one or three holes per more unit cell. Interesting physics also happens there, including topological effects. I will discuss, just discuss them you know, very briefly. Okay? So they have an enormous amount of you know, papers you know, recently showing a lot of very interesting phenomenology. Moreover, they're recently scanning probe microscopy, STM and other scanning probe, uh, local probes, have shown now finally the details of you know, the atomic structure of these systems and correlated that with correlated behavior and other types of behavior, you know, by looking directly, you know, microscopically at the lattice, okay? So I will also show you a little bit about some of these pictures. You know, this was like, you know, three nature papers published on the same day uh, a couple of weeks ago, followed by a nature physics paper, very interesting, just a week later or something like that, yeah? So these papers have been in the archive for a while, but they appeared, you know, more or less all at the same time. So, you know, this is sort of what I want to tell you about. It's a little bit too much, so we'll see again as yesterday. Please ask questions. I don't need to get to everything. Uh, I hope, you know, if I have to cut something, I will cut some of my stuff to show also some of the stuff that other groups have done, okay? But I'll, I'll try to, to go through. Yep? Sorry, maybe I missed it, but what changes from sample to sample so that you now okay. share? So before one and three, stuff at one and three, okay? All of this is seen in the same devices. Okay? It's just, you know, we make more devices, and twist angle changes a little bit, and some twist angles show more prominently some features. For the phenomenology at one and three electrons per more unit cell, there it is important for the topological effects that the graphene is aligned with the, one of the graphene sheets is aligned to the hexagonal boron nitride. To the hexagonal boron nitride. I will talk about this in a moment. Superconductivity, nothing changes. More devices, so you get higher quality devices and you see more stuff. Yeah. Over there, there was a question? Do you have already observed Yes, I will talk about. Yes, I will talk about. Um, HBN and bilayer graphene, stuff happens. I will mention it. Okay. 
the effects of the double more patterns from the twisted bilayer and from the, bile and, and the, and the graphene with the HVM, those are higher order effects, which I don't think people have a clear idea yet of. You know. Theoretically, they typically get ignored because it's a smaller perturbation, but I'm sure soon we'll find also things about that. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about, you know, I told you yesterday about what happened. You know, we announced our, our results, our discovery in the APS March meeting in 2018, okay, and the paper was published in April. So what has happened since, since then, okay? The first thing that has happened is that we have reproduced our own results, okay, many times. This, you know, believe it or not, it doesn't always happen, so it's good that we were able to reproduce ourselves, you know. So by now we have actually lots, lots of more, you know, resistive, you know, uh, traces that go to zero, become superconducting. In fact, we're starting to map what is TC at optimal doping versus twist angle. You see, we have like a dome also versus twist angle, okay? I'll mention a, a couple more things about this in a moment. Now, even better than you reproducing yourself is when someone else reproduces your results, okay? So by now, several other groups have completely independently reproduced our results. Okay? They have seen the same physics and even extending uh, extended the physics in very interesting directions. Yeah. The first group that uh, reproduced our results and extended them was a group of a collaboration between the group of Corey Dean and Andrea Young. This was a really beautiful experiment. I'm, I'm, you know, I was very happy to see it. Remember, I told you that this magic angle condition, oops, am I walking? This magic angle condition depends on the twist angle. Let's see. I don't know what's going on. Depends on the interlayer tunneling between the two graphene sheets, okay? So what this group, what they, in the, this group, what they did, they did the following. First of all, they made a magic angle device and they saw correlated insulator states and superconductivity, so reproduce our results. Then what they did is they fabricated a device with an angle which was larger than the magic angle, 1.27 degrees, as you can see here. They measured it, they didn't see any correlated insulators or any superconductivity. Again, this is very sensitive to the twist angle. You're off magic, you don't see the magic, okay? Now, what they did then was very clever. They applied pressure to the double body, you know, to the twisted bilayer graphene system. When you apply pressure, you increase the interlayer tunnel. Okay? And then they were able to choose the right pressure such that this angle, 1.27 degrees, became the magic angle for the right pressure. Then they measure, and they saw correlated insulator states and superconductivity. They apply larger pressure, so that then you go off magic angle condition, or slightly off, and they saw a weakening of the superconductivity and the correlated behavior, okay? So it was very beautiful, and in fact, you know, they, they could apply, they knew exactly what pressure they had to apply to the system, because a few months earlier, together with my collaborators at Harvard, we had predicted what would be the magic angle dependence on the pressure applied to the twisted bilayer graphene system. Okay? So we had this plot where pressure and you know, the magic angle condition is this red line. So they knew exactly if you're at 1.27 degrees, you have to apply you know, something like you know, 1.33 gigapascals here in order to be at the magic angle condition. So they knew exactly what pressure they, need to, they needed to apply. This is a very difficult experiment. You can do it only a few times. They could apply only two pressures before the sample got destroyed. So it was good that they knew exactly what pressure they had to apply you know, to see this effect. So this was you know, a very beautiful, you know, both confirmation of our results and a very nice extension and proved that this really, this behavior is associated with this flat band condition. Yes? So what range of angles can they go over in previous? And okay, so they, they small angles. So yeah, so these, these pressures are pretty high for the type of techniques that they had. So in practice, they could only go a little bit. You see, they had 1.27, which is quite close to 1.1. Okay, uh, ideally you would want to go to three degrees or something like that, but uh, three degrees, you see, you have to apply you know, 30 gigapascal. There are techniques to apply such pressures, but not in, a, in, in their apparatus, yeah. So, okay, let me, so in addition to this thing, which was the, you know, the first reproduction of, of uh, an extension of our results, a lot more has happened since then, okay? As I mentioned in a moment, you know, a, a moment ago, there was this linear in TV behavior, sort of strange metal Planckian physics, nematicity, competing orders. There has been also ferromagnetism, anomalous hole, and quantum anomalous hole physics. Okay, this is a topological aspect, which I will mention. 
local probe studies, thermodynamic probes, quantum capacitance of the density of states of the system. And we have already three groups, including my group, we have already posted on the archive a second correlated Moray system. This is magic angle twisted by layer by layer graphene. We call it twisted by by, okay? So this is two layers of graphene, Bernal stack. Two layers of graphene, Bernal stack, so four layers in total. And pairwise, now these two and these two, we rotate them by the magic angle. It happens to be a different correlated insulator state, okay? With different magnetic properties and, and, and very interesting physics too. Yep. Sorry, I have a question. What does the magic space mean? I'll, I'll, I'll go over it in a moment, okay? So, now before I tell you about you know, all of these things, or at least a few of them, we, you know, what should we call magic angle and what are the implications, okay? I told you, you know, I've been telling you about the magic angle, the magic angle, the magic angle. Well, as we take, as we measure more and more devices, we realize that the phenomenology of the magic angle, experimental phenomenology, say superconductivity and correlated insulator states, they appear over a small but finite range of twist angles. Okay? In particular, I showed you, you know, our data on optimal doping TC for the, for the highest superconducting dome, which is the one that occurring around minus two holes per more unit cell with a few extra holes, okay? Minus two minus delta, we call it. This is our own data, all the blue data points. There is also one more data point that we added from a paper by Dimitri Efetov at ICFO, where they showed what is their TC at 50% normal state resistance. As you can see, these have error bars in all directions. Now, so we have this dome, you know, versus twist angle, okay? Actually, this dome, it looks like a very nice dome, but if we include some devices where we had more disorder, there are also some data points in there, but those have large disorder. We're not sure about the twist angle. This, we are, I'm showing you data for minus two minus delta, but we, as I told you, we have actually seen superconducting domes and superconductivity for all fillings, minus two minus delta, minus two plus delta, two plus delta, two minus delta. So we have this mapped out for all these things. So the question is now, what should we call magic angle? Yeah? The original definition, you know, one option is the original definition. It was the angle for which the Fermi velocity is zero, or minimum, depending on the model, at the K points. That was the original definition by McDonald. Okay? But you, can, you, know, you could argue that it would make perhaps more sense to call magic angle the angle for which the bandwidth is minimum, since the bandwidth is what is important for these correlated effects, you know, because it's competition between kinetic energy and potential energy yeah, and interaction energy. These two things do not happen at the same angle. Okay? They happen at angles close to each other, but not the same angle. Yet you could even argue a third criterion, okay? which is the angle for which the density of states, in particular the von Hoff singularity, which is seen at, at, in that you know, region in the bands you know, where the, the splitting of the bands occurs, is the strongest or narrowest. So in other words, locally, where you have the flattest band structure, you, know, you have that huge narrow density of states, the narrower it becomes and the taller it becomes, the more prone you're going to be to instabilities towards interaction. Yeah? In fact, in a recent paper, uh, recent work by Ahai uh, Pasupati at Columbia, they argued that this should be the criterion, okay? Because they see some, by some measure, they see the strongest correlated effects there. Now, all of these things, Theoretically, it's not clear how they correlate okay, any of these with the strongest correlated insulator and for what filling. You know, different twist angles have different strengths of correlated insulators for electrons and for holes, or the highest TC, and again, for what filling. Okay? So there is still, I think, a lot of theory that needs to be done to connect these things with these things. Okay? There's not a single magic angle. I think you can argue about different criteria for magic angle, and in any case, the phenomenology is seen over a range of angles. Yep. So, I mean, the, 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 I mean, phenomenologically, I mean, experimentally, what we do is we go to what we were told was the magic angle. We go and get to angles near that magic angle, and we see correlated insulated behavior and superconductivity. The fact seems to be, again, which depends. That's why I have here these question marks. If you look at what's the strongest superconductivity, that doesn't occur where the strongest correlated insulated behavior is, okay? 
So which one do you want? You want the correlated incidental behavior or the superconductivity? Oh, the more, it, it, the, 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 yeah, the size of the insulator gap, yes. Yeah. So, let me, you know, having said all that, I don't have an answer to that question. I leave it, you know, for, for theories to work out, okay? Let me tell you a little bit about some of these, some of these things. So, I want to tell you first, you know, this is the outline of what I'm going to try to tell you over the next, you know, 40 minutes or so. Competing orders in magic angle twisted by electric field. This is not published and also nematicity. So this is the one that I want to tell you the most. Strange metal and twisted by by. It's posted in the archive. So if I don't get there, you can always look. And then I want to spend a few minutes uh, you know, crediting other people's very interesting work and developments in topology and also local probes. So let me start with that. Competing orders. Okay. So this this word competing sometimes called intertwine. Orders is something which is, has been used in many correlated materials and in particularly used in the cuprates, superconductors. Okay? So this is a phase diagram, temperature versus doping for a cuprate superconductor. Zero doping is an antiferromagnetic mode insulator. You add holes and you have this dome. Now, if you pay attention, this is not a single superconducting dome. This is kind of a double dome. There is this dent here on the dome, on TC, okay? Seems like TC seems to be suppressed there, okay? That suppression of TC here, which makes like a, you know, a camel back, you know, uh, shape, is associated typically with charge order. In fact, there are superconductors such as LBCO where TC reaches almost zero there due to strong competition with other orders, okay? I think in this case, it's a stripe phase, okay? So let me show you a little bit what we see in our devices, and we've seen this in, 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 in a number of devices. So this is the high temperature in quotes, you know, high compared to the temperatures I was showing you yesterday, okay? Which I was showing you everything below a Kelvin or below two Kelvin. This is, we're going now to up to 20 Kelvin or so. This is a device, 1.09 degrees, okay? If you measure the resistivity versus temperature and versus density, let me orient you in this plot. This is the charge neutrality, so we have a resistance peak the behavior is metallic, but there is a resistance peak, same as in graphene. You have a resistance peak at charge neutrality. And then you can see that we have features in this direction, I dope with electrons. In this direction, I dope with holes, okay? So if I go and I dope with electrons, we see resistive features at one electron, at two electrons, at three electrons per more unit cell. As I told you, there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens, not just at two, but also at one and three, okay? Let's forget about that for now. If we go in the direction of holes, we see that there's an insulated state that happens there at two holes per more unit cell. Huh? There is also maybe something there up at one, something at three, but let's ignore that for the moment. Let me zoom in in this region. So if we zoom in in that region and we expand a little bit, okay, this density corresponds to two holes per more unit cell. This dark shade is the superconductivity, the superconducting dome. And as you can see right away, this thing is not a single continuous dome. It has a feature there. Okay? Remember, in the cuprate phase diagram, this, this phase diagram, you know, they plot it continuously, but experimentally, they have a few data points here. They trace this in discrete steps. Okay? Here we can trace this continuously because we have continuous control over the density. Now, as you can see, this, this, this feature actually seems to come from a high temperature resistive feature. This is a resistance peak with respect to nearby densities, which comes from high energy, okay, from high temperature. Let me zoom in a bit more. Okay? So here is that resistance thing. I'm zooming in even a bit more. Okay? This is, again, minus 2 filling, so 2 holes per more unit cell. This is minus 2 minus delta, hold open. Okay? If you Put it in terms of doping with respect to the insulator. This is zero, and this corresponds to more holes. And you can see this trace here. Yeah? Now, we have that feature there that comes from high energy. This, you know, when I saw it, initially when I saw it, I thought, oh, maybe this is noise or something. Yeah? But then when you see it again, and you see it again, okay? and then you start to think that there's perhaps something there. Okay? So you can see that this is quite reminiscent. This is zero 
whole doping, this is zero whole doping of this type of behavior. Now, so let's see, you know, this is a color plot, so let me show you actually some traces, okay? So if we have some horizontal traces like this, yeah? The resistance versus doping looks like this. This is the maximum that goes to the correlated insulator behavior. And a little bit of it, okay? You see that there is this bump at high energies, which becomes more and more localized, okay? And interrupts the superconductivity on either side there. Huh? So the thing that we thought is, okay, there seems to be something here killing superconductivity, making a resistive state, which is competing with the superconductivity. Why don't we do the following? Let's apply a small magnetic field so that we suppress superconductivity and let's see what's behind, what's there wanting to compete, okay? So that's what we did, okay? This is the exact same data at zero Tesla. And now we apply a small magnetic field, 0.5 Tesla, and this is what we see, okay? We have, in this at the exact same density, we still have insulated state. The nearby region is connected to this feature and it exhibits an insulated state. In fact, if you take a vertical trace there at those two locations, you see that at zero Tesla, you have superconductivity. At 0.5 Tesla, you have an insulated state at low temperature. Okay? So you can do the same thing. You, know, you can take another device. This one, the previous one was 1.09 degrees. This one is 1.07 degrees. Okay? Here, the correlated insulated state is very weak at two holes per molar unit cell. You know, it's barely present, but you still have a dome sorry for the contrast, with a dip here, okay? You still have, you know, with this feature, we call it the banana, you know? It helps that it's yellow in this color scale, you know? But it has this banana shape. So we have this feature here. Now if you apply a small magnetic field, perpendicular, you see this correlated insulated state still there, very weak, but you have this thing connected and a strong insulated state at zero temperature, okay? You can again take traces there Okay? And you see superconductivity, if you apply a small magnetic field, you see a strong insulating behavior. Okay? Let, me leave, let me leave this for now, for a moment. I'm gonna come back to it in a little bit. Okay? But for now, this is the story. There seems to be some competition between some order and superconductivity. If you suppress, you know, superconductivity wins at zero magnetic field. But if you suppress superconductivity with a magnetic field, then that order leads to an insulated state at low temperature. Okay. Let me tell you about nematicity. So nematicity is, 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 you know, means spontaneous breaking of lattice rotational symmetry of some order parameter. Yeah? Many families of quantum materials show this. It has been particularly studied in the nictites, but also the cuprates and heavily doped topological insulators show this. Nematicity. You know, it's a you know, it's something that, that, that comes, the language comes from liquid crystals, okay? And it typically means that you choose a direction, okay? You have some order parameter which, you know, you might suspect, I don't know, if you have a square lattice that it would follow, you know, C4, you know, symmetry, but suddenly your system decides to choose a direction. You go from whatever symmetry, C4, C6, whatever, to C2. Just choose a direction, okay? Now, it can happen in the normal state, in the superconducting state or in both, and it has different implications depending on when and how it happens. So this is you know, uh, it taken from a review by Rafael Fernandez of nematicity in the nictites in a phase diagram. What people see is that there is this region, this red region here, it's the nematic state, There's some nematic fluctuations on top, and it's again characterized by anisotropies, for example, in the resistivity. This is an example from doped topological insulators. So I think this is copper dope, but it could be chromium dope or vanadium dope, bismuth selenide. It is a superconductor when you dope bismuth selenide with, with various dopants. And in the superconducting state, people have measured here an anisotropy in the resistivity or in the critical temperature or in the critical magnetic field. Yeah? As you can see here, there are two maxima from zero to two pi. There are two maxima that corresponds to an ellipse. An ellipse has C2 symmetry. That's what I meant by having a director, okay? system chooses a direction, even though the bismuth selenide structure is hexagonal. Okay? So let me show you, you know, our measurements. So we take a device, you know, a magic angle, twisted by you know, we have four probe measurements, and we now 
you know, to measure resistance. This is a device with a pretty high TC, 3.1 Kelvin, 50% normal cell to resistance. This is the complete dome versus density, you know, in, in log scale, so that you can see some features more pronounced, okay? And if you measure now the resistivity as a function of in-plane magnetic field magnitude and direction, but in-plane, okay, what we see is this twofold, is two maxima, okay? Again, two maxima, when you put in polar plots, you know, when you put this in a polar plot, means an ellipse, which is giving you a direction, the major axis of the ellipse. Okay, so let me show you the ellipse. This is the ellipse. If you measure the resistivity versus magnetic field in the x and y direction in plane, okay, you have this ellipse. Blue means superconducting, red means not superconducting. So you can see this device, if I apply the magnetic field in this direction, it superconducts. If you apply this magnetic field in this direction, it has a critical field which is smaller. Okay, so the critical field is anisotropic in the direction of the in-plane magnetic field. Now, the nice thing about twisted bilayographing compared to any of the other systems that people have investigated is that we can do this. We can study this continuously as a function of density. Now, okay, so let me guide you. This is a lot of pictures. So here, what we're doing is at 0.9 Kelvin, which is an intermediate temperature so that we can reach the critical field within our, you know, finite magnetic field strength of one Tesla in plane, okay? At different densities, okay? We're going here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, it's going like A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, you know, through the superconducting dome, okay? So we start with A, we're at 0.9 Kelvin, we're barely, you know, superconducting, but you can still see a little bit the axis of the lips, and we go like this, we go to optimal doping. There, even with one Tesla in plane magnetic field, the system is always superconducting because that's too high TC for us to kill it with one Tesla in plane magnetic field, and then we continue, okay? Now, I wanna, you, know, you have here at optimal doping, if we go to higher temperature, you can eventually, eventually kill it. I want you to pay attention, there's a lot of information here, what I want you to pay attention to is the following. As I go from B, C, you know, E, F to G, H, you see that here the lips is oriented in this direction, here in H, the lips is oriented in this direction, there's a rotation Okay, it's actually a flip of the major axis of the lips. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, but remember this. So you can study all of this, the, the major and minor axis of the lips, their revolution with temperature and magnetic field, and you can study what temperature does this nematicity onset in the superconducting state. It's not very surprising that we see that it traces the superconducting dome because you know, we're looking at the nematicity by looking at critical field, which is something that happens in the superconducting state, so it's not that surprising. Let me give you an alternative view of this anisotropy, okay? So one thing that we're, you know, in, in, in these measurements, what we're doing is we are applying enough magnetic field to reach the critical field and therefore bring the system out of the superconducting state. Yeah, sometimes we have to do this at higher temperatures, etc. We can do something which is different, but sort of complementary. We can keep the system at very low temperature, you know, in the ground state, and keep a relatively small magnetic field, so the system is still superconducting, but now run a large current through the device so that we see if the critical current also experiences anisotropies with the direction of the magnetic field, okay? So, this is something that it's shown in these videos. This is going to be too complex. I just want to give you a flavor of how much you know, tuning parameters and control we have. I'll show a, a, snap, a proper snapshot later. These are angle in the vertical axis, current bias in the horizontal axis. These are for different magnitudes of the parallel magnetic field. And I'm going to run a video with five movies for different densities, okay? So again, I know this is complicated. This is just to to brag about how much control we have, you know, how many tuning knobs we have, okay? So you can see a lot happens. Let me just give you an interesting snapshot of those movies. It's this, okay? Focus, for example, on this. Here, for 0.8 Tesla parallel field at a given density, what you can see is that as a function of direction of the magnetic field, my system can be superconducting, blue means superconducting, or can be insulator, red means insulator. Okay, and this depends on what direction the magnetic field is. This is always below the critical field of the superconductor. Okay, so another way of looking at this thing is look at these waterfall plots. This is the differential resistance versus current bias, and the different lines 
correspond to different angles, okay? What you can see is that there's a switching current which oscillates with angle. It has two maxima, so again, it's an ellipse. So the system chooses a direction, yeah? That's an indication of pneumaticity. As you can see, there is another switching event here. It also has two maxima. If you pay attention, you will notice that this and this, the maxima here and the maxima here are actually offset by about 120 degrees, yeah? which could have also implications in terms of pneumatic domains and also certain anisotropies of the gap. Okay, so I've told you about these two things. This competing order story about competition between some order and superconductivity. I've told you now a story about nematicity and isotropies in the superconducting state. What about the normal state? Does it exhibit anisotropies? Yeah? So what about the normal state? So if we go here to this plot again, I've shown you this plot earlier. This is the banana. This is the correlated insulated state for two holes. This is resistivity versus temperature and doping. This, this white you know, circles trace now the superconducting dome. Okay? Remember, this is minus two holes. So two holes per molar unit cell. This is the, the banana, you know, the, the competing order feature. Okay? Now, this is measured in a whole bar geometry. So we can now do the equivalent of a whole measurement, except that it's going to be at zero magnetic field. So I'm just going to measure the resistivity in the transverse direction. Yeah? I expect to see zero because there's no magnetic field. Okay? But this is what we see. If you do measure the whole, a hole in quotes, because it's at zero magnetic field, okay? just the transverse voltage, whole bar versus temperature and density, you see this very prominent feature. This very prominent feature happens exactly, I'm just laying this line on top here in this axis without modifying it. You can see that it happens exactly where we have this feature here. Yeah? Now, why would you have some transverse resistance? Yeah? Let's imagine you have a system, you know, which is anisotropic, where the resistivity in the direction one and the direction two are different, okay? So the resistivity tensor has a row one and a row two, and these two are different. If you make a whole bar, and the direction of your whole bar, the x and y axis in your whole bar, are along the one and two directions, then you expect to measure zero transverse voltage at zero magnetic field, okay? However, in our magic angle devices, in general, the shape of our whole bar is not oriented with the anisotropy axis of the system. Okay? So if you have an anisotropic system, and in general you define a whole bar, you have to now multiply by a rotation matrix your resistivity tensor so that your resistivity has five diagonal terms. Okay? So in particular, as long as the sine two theta is different from zero, Okay? You have a rho x y, a transverse voltage, that is proportional to the difference in resistivity to the anisotropy. Okay? Now, you have to be a little bit careful with this with the transport experts in the audience because you can have some misalignment between your rho x x contacts that can give you also some difference, but we can correct for this and symmetrize, anti-symmetrize, do anything that we want you know, to, to correct for this. And the result at zero magnetic field of the corrected rx x y is this, okay? Forget about small, small shades of red or blue. The important thing is to see that there's this very strong, in fact, it's off scale here, okay? This is saturated, the color scale here. This feature, exactly where that competing order feature was, okay? You can normalize also Rxy by Rxx so that this is proportional to the, you know, it gives you in, in you know, dimensionless units, you know, what is the scale of the anisotropy. And you can see that it reaches values of 50%, okay? It's a huge anisotropy, okay? So the story that is emerging, you know, from all these measurements is the following, okay? And by the way, I should mention that recent STM work on magic angle graphene by, by several people, in particular the group of Ivan Dre, but also the group of Abhai Pasupati and Stefan Perch, they have seen signatures of nematicity in different regions, at charge neutrality, in other regions of density, some signatures, okay? So the picture that is coming together with all the measurements that I've shown you, you know, uh, so far is the following. At zero doping, we have this correlated insulated state, and then we have a superconducting dome. In this phase diagram of temperature versus doping, this superconducting dome has sort of a double bump structure, and that bump, double bump, you know, the, the, the feature here happens because there is 
some region of some order which is competing with superconductivity. That's why it creates a dip there. This region exhibits anisotropies in the resistivity and twofold, okay? So they are likely originating from you know, pneumatic, you know, from electronic correlations. They have a finite density stent. Yeah? If this was just some trivial strong structural strain, it would be present at all densities. But this happens only in certain density regions. Yeah? Separately, okay, everywhere in the superconducting dome, you have pneumaticity in the superconducting state. Yeah? If you look in the overdoped region here, your pneumatic axis is in some direction. When you tune your density such that you go to the region where you have normal state pneumaticity, the axis, you know, your pneumatic director for the superconductivity flips. Okay? So what that means is the following. Your superconducting state is pneumatic. The direction that it chooses for pneumaticity, there is probably some weak strain that is ultimately pinning it in some direction. Otherwise, it would be freely rotating, okay? even though it would be a pneumatic director. So there's probably some little something structural. You know, there's always a coupling between electronic and structure that pins it. But once you reach a density for which the system has already chosen a strong direction in the normal state, stripes, charge order, something, some pneumatic direction, in the normal state, the superconducting state aligns itself with that, okay? And that's why it flips exactly when we go to that region. Okay? So this is you know, sort of what we are, uh, that's our understanding. This is experimental data. I don't want to say too much about theory, but you know, for, for the, since most of the evidence are theories and there's a, a few experts, having a pneumatic state which is only pneumatic in the superconducting state such as here has deep implications for the types of, or the parameters that you could have, and also deep implications for topology in the system, okay? I don't want to say too much, both because I think you know, it's speculative and you know, we don't have data backing that there is, what, what is the symmetry of the other parameter, but I think, you know, the theorists and the audience can figure out that this is this could be quite special. Now, um, let me tell you a little bit. Let me see. I still have about 20 minutes. Let me tell you a little bit about strange metal behavior. Yeah. So, what are strange metals? Again, this is a term which is you know is, 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 is something that happens in, in in many correlated materials. It is you know strange metal phase is characterized by strange behavior, hence the name. Okay. Basically, behavior which is at odds with conventional Fermi liquid, and this happens in many properties. One of the most typical you know, and, and, and studied types of behavior is that the resistivity is linear in temperature down to very low temperature and all the way often to very high temperatures. Okay? In particular, at very low temperature, you would expect a quadratic behavior rather than linear behavior, and this is very strange. Many families of correlated materials, again, show this. The ruthenate, the cobaltate, some nictites, heavy fermions, cuprates. It's the largest piece of the phase diagram in the cuprates phase diagram, typically. This big wedge above optimal doping, strange metal. Yep? Are strange metal and lead interchangeable? Sorry? Strange metal and? Are strange metal and lead interchangeable? No, I don't think they are interchangeable at all. Okay. Lead interchangeable liquid is something that happens in one dimension. This is something that happens in 2D, and, and they have different. You know, I think one is better understood than the other. Uh, strange metal, I don't think there's a theory of strange metals. Nobody really understands. Oh, there may be some theories, but not universally agreed upon theory. So these are some you know, pictures from, from cuprates where certain dopings, if you are right above optimal doping, it's very linear. If you deviate from optimal doping, you have some nonlinearities and eventually it becomes linear. This is uh, behavior in heavy fermions. The resistivity versus temperature is extremely linear down to extremely low temperatures. Yeah. Now, this strange metal behavior, not only is this linear resistivity present, it also happens to have, in mean, many strange metals, the scattering rate exhibits a universal behavior, which, which was conjectured, you know, uh, uh, exhibits a Planckian bound. This means that the scattering rate is proportional to, you know, KB, T, H bar, you know, fundamental quantities, and then a proportionality coefficient, which happens to be very close to one for many correlated materials. Yeah? So this was first studied, I mean, I mean, first studied by many groups, but nicely compiled by the group of Andy McKenzie, where they showed, you know, in, in a little bit strange units. But basically, this line says alpha or C is equal to one. 
many correlated materials exhibit this behavior. Also, interestingly, some uncorrelated materials, such as you know, copper, gold, etc., at high temperatures, not at low temperatures, but at high temperatures, they also exhibit this behavior. More recently, the group of Louis Tyler Ferg has shown that for cuprates and organic superconductors, this alpha, again, is you know, within 50% within of, of one, something like that, okay? It's not a quantized property, but it's funny. This could be 10 to the minus three or 10 to the plus three. It actually happens to be very close to one for many materials. So if you look, you know, if we go to this uh, schematic phase diagram that I showed you before for magic angle graphene, you look at, around the correlated insulated behavior, and now you measure resistivity versus temperature to higher temperatures than I showed before. What you see is that at low temperatures, you have, of course, superconductivity or insulating behavior, you know, all kinds of things. But when you go to high temperature, your resistivity becomes very linear, okay? This is for a device where the, the, the TC was pretty high, so it takes a while in temperature to get out of the superconducting state. But you can also choose devices where you go to one of these superconducting domes, which is tiny, okay, at, at two minus delta over there. And you can see that this linear behavior is extremely linear from about 0.5 Kelvin right before superconductivity onsets all the way to temperatures of 30 Kelvin and, and beyond in these cars that we couldn't measure higher temperatures. But you know, these temperatures, 25, 30 Kelvin, are about the Fermi temperature in this system. This is equivalent to, in, in the cuprates, going to a few thousand Kelvin and seeing linear behavior all the way through, okay? So from the very lowest to pretty high temperature. Again, because we have continuous density control, we can do this versus density. So um, you know, these color curves are exploring this region, this region for two different devices. They're, they're one, both 1.16 degrees, but they're actually different uh, devices. You know? And you can see that there is not a big variation in the slope versus density of this linear behavior, okay? Now, you can quantify this, you know, sorry, one, one more thing I wanted to say is, it's not just that this behavior is linear. If you look at the actual value of the slope, which we plot here versus twist angle for different devices, these values of resistivity, the slopes, are extremely high, okay? They're actually, you know, it varies from tens to hundreds of ohms per Kelvin, which is comparable, in fact, quite a bit higher than for the cuprates, okay? When you normalize the cuprates to, so that you have two-dimensional resistivities. And in particular, there are many orders of magnitude, three, four, the, four orders of magnitude higher than in monolayer graphene, the slopes of the resistivity, okay? Now, if you go away from the correlated insulated region, if you go you know, closer to charge neutrality, you see a more quadratic behavior. It's actually a power law. It's not quite quadratic. It's a power law with exponent of 1.6, 1.8, depends on density, okay? But away from this correlated insulated behavior, it's not so linear, okay? Certainly not to low temperatures. Now, I should mention that uh, yeah, if you now, in, in some of our devices, we have clean enough samples that we can measure the temperature dependence of the Shunikov that has oscillations and extract actually the scattering rates in the same way that it was done in this McKenzie paper, okay? And we can extract that and extract the coefficient as a function of density now continuously okay, for our devices. And we see that this coefficient, you know, is certainly within an order of magnitude of one. You know, above here is within 50%. Here it goes down to 0.3. Within a factor of three, you know, it is quite, you know, close to this Planckian bound that was mentioned in previous papers, okay? So it seems like twisted valet graphene is a uh, similar phenomenology as strange metals with a near Planckian bound scattering rate. Now, so theorists, you know, are, are looking at some of the uh, possible explanations for this thing. Some theorists think that scattering by acoustic phonons may be responsible because they can give you a linear resistivity in temperature, okay? Or scattering in general by bosonic degrees of freedom. So this, this, you know, there are a couple of papers for, with scattering by acoustic phonons. They seem to underestimate the magnitude of the scattering and the twist angle dependence by an order or two of magnitude, both in the case of these acoustic phonons. And in this case, which is a bit more realistic, which includes more air pattern fluctuations and, and, and of, of, you know, basically coupling of the electrons to the degrees of freedom from the more lattice, okay? The, the sort of a breathing mode of the more lattice. Another thing that, you know, this, none of these 
theory papers captures, which is quite important, is that, again, more superlattices are different from regular superlattices. For example, both of these papers are taking the graphene phonons as you know, regular graphene phonons for twisted bilayer graphene. Basically, no coupling. This is the phonon spectrum of regular graphene, and they are not assuming any coupling. But if you include the actual coupling, okay, or this thing are called more phonons in twisted bilayer graphene, the recent calculations that show that then the phonon spectrum becomes gapped. Your acoustic phonons now become gapped. Okay? If you have gapped phonons so that you have now optical, a whole set of optical phonon branches here rather than just acoustic branches, this means that it is extremely rare, given the magnitude of the, you know, the energies that people have calculated for these more phonons, that within this relatively large temperature range, which exactly goes through these energy scales, you do not have any kink in the resistivity versus temperature. Each time you reach one of these phonons, you should get a kick, an extra contribution to your resistivity. Okay? So this curve should be kink, linear kink-wise, if you know, this behavior was due to phonons. It doesn't seem to be the case, okay? so it probably is more complicated, although nobody has calculated the resistivity with this type of more phonons, so we're still waiting to see what happens. Other people, in particular, uh, you know, Li Lian Fu, which has um, this theory of, of where uh, something called a higher order Van Hoff singularity plays a prominent role on the correlated physics and superconductivity of magic angle graphene. Yeah? These Van Hoff singularities are not standard Van Hoff singularities. They are more divergent in energy than standard Van Hoff singularities. They happen exactly at the magic angle, that special divergence. And there's some theories of strange metals out there which include you know, coupling to very strong Van Hoff singularities, and who knows, perhaps some combination of these things you know, explains the data, but you know, again, proper theory needs to be made. Now, I have 10 minutes. I'm going to very quickly tell you about Twisted Bye Bye and then work by other groups. So what is you know, bilayer graphene? Okay? So if you take a piece of graphite and two, you take two layers out rather than one layer out. Okay? This is usually AB Bernal or Bernal stack bilayer graphene. Okay? When you have Bernal stack bilayer graphene, the spectrum is no longer linear. It's quadratic, but also gapless. Okay? And this gapless electronic structure, you can gap it if you apply a transverse electric field. The, the, the reason why the, the spectrum of bilayer graphene is gapless is because there is a symmetry between the bottom and the top layer. If you apply an electric field, you break that symmetry, and the spectrum gaps. Okay? So now we have, and this has been seen by you know, hundreds of groups. So now we're going to do the following. We're going to take AB Bernal stack bilayer graphene, one sheet, AB Bernal stack bilayer graphene, another sheet. We're going to put them on top of each other, rotated by the magic angle. Okay? And what you see is the following. In a diagram of resistance versus back gate and top gate, that means versus bottom electrode voltage and top electrode voltage so that we can apply an electric field. Yeah? We can, if we apply the same polarity to these two electrodes, we're varying the density. If we apply opposite polarities, we're varying the electric field transverse to the two layers. Yeah? So you should think of, of this axis is this is the density axis when I apply same polarity voltage to both gates. This is the displacement field or electric field axis when I apply opposite voltages to the two gates. Yeah? And what you can see is the following. At the double charge neutrality point, we have metallic. You know, red is insulator. Blue is metallic. So we have insulator behavior. That's because the electronic structure is, 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 is not gapped. And bilayer graphene is, is a metal. If you put two layers on top of each other, it's a metal. Turns out the band structure is flat, but the charge neutrality is still a metal, similar to twisted bilayer graphene. If you now apply at charge neutrality a displacement field, an electric field, you see that you go to an insulated behavior. That again is normal, because bilayer graphene gaps when you apply an electric field. If you have two layers, you gap them both with an electric field. Okay? Now, let me change the density. If I put four electrons or four holes per more unit cell, I also go insulated. Those are the single particle gaps. Something similar to monolayer, monolayer graphene happens. You have more super lattices with single particle gaps. The interesting thing happens here. When I put two electrons per more unit cell, if I apply an electric field, okay? 
Now, correlated insulator state appears at half filling, okay? So in this case, it's a little bit, you know, somewhat cleaner how to understand this based on the band structure. These are now the same data, but rotated so that you can see um, displacement field and density independently. This is a charge neutrality point. This is full filling of the Moray unit cell. This is half filling, these features here, okay? So the band structures tells you, calculations tell you that the, when you put bilayer graphene on top of bilayer graphene with a twist angle, you form a set of flat tissue bands, but not super flat, okay? So at zero displacement field, okay, you do not have an insulator at half filling, like in the case of mono-mono. But if you apply a transverse electric field, this, this set of these flatted bands, which were not super flat, now they become gap and become flatter. In particular, the upper one, the conduction band, becomes flatter and you can, when you put half, you know, half the number of electrons, you know, when you half fill that band, you actually get a correlated insulator state, yeah? So, the same physics has been seen by two other groups. I think I listed them, did I list them somewhere? Yeah, so related, you know, exact same stuff has been seen by Philip Kim's group and by the Zhang group in China, okay? And this system is quite interesting and quite distinct, okay? So it exhibits correlated insulator state at half filling, also by the way at quarter filling and in a magnetic field at three quarters filling. But this correlated insulator state is not made out of singlets, like in the case of monolayer, monolayer, it happens to be spin polarized, okay? So the magnetic properties are different. And it also exhibits magnetic phase transitions as a function of perpendicular magnetic field. Let me skip that. These are the phase transitions. This is the spin polarization showing that the correlated insulator states grow with parallel magnetic field as opposed to getting killed, like in the case of monolayer, monolayer. In the last couple of minutes, let me actually go to other interesting developments, yeah? So I told you that you know, in these correlated more heterostructures, there's a com coming together merging of, of various communities, 2D materials, strongly correlated, and topology, okay? Let me tell you about, you know, the, 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 a bit more about the topologies in it, since it's the you know, subject of the, of the workshop. So already from, from, you know, pretty early on, there were uh, theoretical calculations. Yes, okay, so, you know, together with my collaborators, I, you know, this is really Central's group, I just provided inspiration. You know, we calculated that these nearly flat churn bands, so these this flat bands in more super lattices would actually have finite churn numbers, an interesting topology, okay? So we calculated a variety of systems, you know, bilayer graphene HBN, trilayer graphene HBN, bi, bilayer, bilayer, trilayer, 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 bilayer, various types, okay? And you can calculate what is the churn number under different conditions of angle and interaction, strength, etc. I have to say that, you know, if, even before this paper, there was earlier work by, by also by Ashwin and, and Sentil, you know, um, really explaining the role of topology in the system, also by, you know, work by Andre Bernbeck and a, a few others. So this all remained a little bit, you know, theory land until uh, a few months later, the group of David Gohaber Gordon at Stanford showed this very interesting data. Okay? You measure resistivity versus magnetic field, okay, at three electrons per more unit cell. You have this hysteresis loop. And if you measure Rxy, you have this big hysteresis loop with a huge Rxy value at zero, okay? Later on, there were also experiments in ABC trilayer graphene aligned with hexagonal boron nitride. And very quickly, because of this previous paper, very quickly within a week, okay, theory papers appear explaining all of this, okay? Turns out that in these devices, and they have evidence, experimental evidence for this, the twisted bilayer graphene, so this is monolayer or monolayer, one of the graphene sheets happens to be aligned with the hexagonal boron nitride lattice. The hexagonal boron nitride is a very similar lattice to graphene, just with boron and nitrogen atoms alternating in the A and B sub lattices, okay? And it turns out that this coupling of the, one of the graphene sheets to the boron nitride gaps out the Dirac points in graphene. Now, it's a little bit tricky because if you just take regular graphene, one layer, and you put it on hexagonal boron nitride and align it, you open a gap, but you make a trivial insulator. 
But twisted valet graphene has special characteristics. The Dirac cones in twisted valet graphene as such that when you gap them, you go into a topological insulator, not a trivial insulator. Okay? And this has to do with the details, you know, you can ask Mike Saletel or, or Andre very bit for, for, for more information, but with the details of what are, you know, the very faces in the, in the, uh, in the Dirac cones which are responsible, you know, the, the two sets of Dirac cones that you get when you align this, okay? They happen to be different from what you have in monolithic graphene for the two valleys. So this was, you know, very interesting development. It just got published in Science a few weeks ago. And six months later, the thing became even better, okay? Here you see a very a huge value of the whole angle, but not yet quantized. This was a, num a large anomalous hole effect. And six months later, the group of Andrea Young uh, in Santa Barbara made higher quality devices aligned with HBN, and they measured a very beautiful actual quantization, okay, of the whole resistance at zero magnetic field. So the quantized anomalous hole effect in this exact same system, okay? So it's very clear that, you know, this is a system where topology you know, plays a very important role, and topology with flat bands means that there may be, you know, a good system to explore correlations in, uh, in, in topological systems or topology in correlated systems. And in the last minute, let me just say that, you know, they're having a also very interesting scanning tunnel, local probe studies, in particular scanning tunnel microscopy. So two weeks ago, there were three papers in Nature published on the same day, okay, looking for the first time at the structure of twisted, you know, magic angle twisted by graphene under the correlations. The week later, there was another paper in Nature Physics. You know, it doesn't fit in the page, so, but to do them justice, let me actually rotate it, by the group of Stefan Nutperch. They all see, the basics is very similar. In all four studies, the details vary a little bit depending on studies. Let me just flash a couple of things. They are doing scanning tunnel microscopy and they can look directly at the moray lattice. And for example, one of the things that they can do is the, the, the steam people are now learning how to use this gate voltage and they're enjoying it a lot, you know, to vary the density. So you can measure, you know, this is gate voltage, this is energy or, or voltage to STM tip. And what they can see, they see these two features, these are the two Van Hoff singularities. You can see them here. This is the region of the flat bands. If your chemical potential is in the remote bands, outside the flat bands, these guys are very close together. But when you put your chemical potential into the flat bands, suddenly the bandwidth whoop, becomes much bigger of the system, okay? So all four papers see this, okay? It seems that when you put your chemical potential in the flat bands, now your bandwidth is no longer set by the single particle band structure, but the interactions themselves set the bandwidth of the system, okay? I should also point out that the group of Eve Andre, but also Nat Perch, they show that there is evidence for nematicity, okay? in the system with interesting, you know, uh, interesting implications. Now, this, this increased bandwidth is also seen in compressibility measurements by my colleague, Ray Ashuri. We also see an enhanced bandwidth when you put the chemical potential in bands. So this is by now confirmed with several techniques. And the last bit of data that I wanna show is a very recent stuff that we posted, my colleague Elisaldov and myself. We're doing a very interesting study you know, Elie Saldov has developed this technique where they have a squid, a superconducting quantum interference device at the, on, a, on a tip, on a very small tip. This means that you can, local, you can measure locally the magnetic field with very high precision, especially in very high resolution and precision in magnetic field. Okay? So the thing that we do is we first take our samples and we do transport. Actually, you can do transport in situ while the scanning tip is there. This is Density here, in terms of you know, number of electrons per molar unit cell, four, three, two, one, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, versus magnetic field. You can see this is a very high quality sample with very nice Landau fan diagrams with features at one, two, three electrons per molar unit cell. So this is state of the art type of devices. And now you have made your transport. You can actually see there the superconducting dome which gets killed at small magnetic field. This is, you know, this is Tesla scale. You can see the superconducting dome. So we can measure in situ superconductivity, in situ the correlations. And now we go with our scanning nanosquid and we look what's happened locally. Okay? The type of traces, if you park at a given spot on the sample and you do lambda level spectroscopy, you measure traces like this. Okay? This is resistance and this is scanning nanosquid, you know, magnetic field signal from the scanning nanosquid. 
This is complicated, so I don't want to explain too much. Let me just say that all these peaks, these are the Landau levels in the system at very small magnetic fields, much smaller than we can resolve properly in transport. The separation between these Landau levels tells you the degeneracy. As I told you yesterday, the degeneracy is fourfold near charge neutrality, twofold near the correlated insulators, onefold when you go to three and minus three you know, electrons per mole unit cell. There's a lot of information here. Then we can do this spatially. This axis is now space, yeah? And we can see how this varies locally. So we can build maps of the local twist angle with a precision of 0 0.002 degrees or better, depending how much we average, okay? So this is a map for, for, for a device such as the previous one where it had exhibited this very high quality behavior. It turns out, if you look at the entire region, this is the histogram for device B, okay? You can see that there is about a, a almost 0.1 degree variation in the twist angle, but if you look at the central region in between the RXX contacts where we measure this high quality signal, it's about, that corresponds actually to this, it's about 0 0.02 degrees, okay? We measure different devices and we see that there is a correlation between the quality of the transport signal, the correlations of superconductivity, and the degree of disorder in twist angle, okay? There is information here on, on strain and there's a lot of stuff, you know, that I invite you to, to have a look at the paper and, and see there's a lot of stuff, data for theories to look at. So with this, I want to acknowledge my group members, okay, for the stuff that I saw, I told you yesterday and today, this is done largely by Joan Sao and more recently Daniel and Oriol and also a, a lot of my collaborators, collaborators at MIT, Harvard, NIMS, and, and of course, uh, Elise Seldov and other people which I forgot to put because I prepared this just a moment ago. Thank you. It's roughly independent of. So no, the, aniso the anisotropy is very much dependent on density, right? I showed you the the data. I I know it's a lot of data, so let me just show it again. So the the anisotropy is very much density dependent. I'll show you this, for example. Okay, you can see that the anisotropy is, has a finite extent in density. So it's density dependent, the anisotropy in the normal state. You can see it here, it's also temperature dependent. This temperature is, this axis is temperature. So it is indeed temperature dependent. Yeah? Um, since we're late, I think we should move to the coffee break, but you can I'll be back questions. in 20 You'll minutes. Yeah. All right, so thank you. So much. second half of the afternoon session whenever you're ready. Okay, so welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed coffee and the cookies. Okay, you get me for another hour. Okay, I'll try to be shorter, 55 minutes this time so that we can all go to and enjoy the procession. What's going on? Oh, the door. Oh, the door, okay. Good. So I'm gonna switch topics a little bit. Basically, I'm, I'm gonna switch actually materials and a little bit, put maybe a little bit more emphasis on topology also, okay, rather than correlations. So I want to tell you about how to, or how are we thinking about engineering you know, various types of topological physics with Van der Waals heterostructures, with, with 2D materials heterostructures. Yeah? So, I, you know, we've, we've had you know, a number of talks about topology. I, you know, one way to think about um, in, you know, materials-wise about topology is you, know, you have materials which are topological objects, you know, for example, you have bismuth selenide, it's a chunk of crystal, it's a topological insulator, nature was very kind, it gave us a material which is a topological insulator, theories were happy, experimentalists were happy, you look at it with ARPES, it happens to be a topological insulator, okay? Similar story happens with, you know, vile semi-metals, there are different types of vile semi-metals, okay, you can grow a crystal, you can do ARPES, you can do STM, you can see that it is a vile semi-metal, okay? Maybe now you can do something with it. But nature gives you these type of materials, and you know that's one way of thinking about topological physics. On the other hand, you can also try to come up with topology and engineering it by using materials which are not topological themselves. Okay, so 
one example is you know, something that Moti has been you know, giving several lectures about is you take gallium arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide. These are not topological materials. You put them together, you create a two-dimensional electron gas, which is not topological. But now you apply a magnetic field, you go into the quantum hole regime or fractional quantum hole regime, and topology happens. Yeah? There's sort of one way of, of having engineered a, a you know, topological system. There is you know, one of the most extreme examples I know of engineering topology is you can take a piece of plastic, drill holes in a certain way in it, okay, and you can engineer vial points in a photonic crystal. This is macroscopic, you know, big size. You drill it or you 3D print it, you know, and you get topological physics out of engineering a piece of plastic. Okay, so that's actually quite dramatic. Now, as as you know, Charlie mentioned and, and Joel Moore also mentioned earlier uh, today and yesterday. Nowadays, you can engineer topological physics by making you know, hybrid you know, systems, or hybrid quantum materials. Basically, you can take star Q, star H, where star means any letter of the alphabet. So you can take quantum spin hole, fractional quantum hole, quantum anomalous hole effect, you know, any letter of the alphabet that you want plus quantum hole physics. If you couple it to superconductors and or ferromagnets, then you can get interesting topological objects. Okay? Some of the earlier predictions were by, by Liang Fu and Charlie Kane, and also by Ben Acker, about coupling quantum spin hole edges to superconductors and ferromagnets okay, to, to induce Majorana fermions. More recently, more exotic types of uh, topological excitations. Okay, as, 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 as Charlie mentioned, these ones give you, does it, they don't give you universal you know, quantum computing power. Okay? You can only do certain types of computation. If you want really to go universal, you have to do more exotic things, like, for example, coupling fractional quantum hole states with superconductors, okay? And even special fractional quantum hole states, okay? To superconductors, to realize all kinds of things you know, with very fancy names like parafermions, Fibonacci phases, etc. Huh? Now, in, in, you know, in my group and in many other groups around the world, we're trying to engineer these phases and we want to engineer them by using 2D materials. And, and the reason is that basically we have each of the individual ingredients, star Q, star H systems with 2D materials. Superconductors we have with 2D materials, also with 3D, of course. And as of very recently, we also have 2D magnets. Yeah? So another question is, can we put them together to do these things? Yeah? But for now, we're busy you know, working on each of these pieces. We haven't done so much work yet at putting them together, although there's some progress. So, let me tell you a little bit about this. Huh? Now, this you know, seminal experiment by you know, there was the early theoretical predictions by, by Charlie and, and, and Jean and, and then by Andre and, and Sujin Sang and then the experimental demonstration of the quantum spin hole effect. This was done in systems where you have you know, time reversal symmetry. So this was a realization in, in Mercury uh, telluride, coming telluride of the two-dimensional time reversal invariant, you know, topological insulators. You know, the resistance was measured, and you get a two e or the conductance two e squared over h, you know, for 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 the system. Now, you can also realize a version of the quantum spin hole effect, but breaking time reversal symmetry. Let me show you how you can do that. Yeah? So, let's take a Dirac cone. Okay. This is a Dirac cone. This is the you know the conduction band. This is the valence band, charge neutrality point. Now let's apply a magnetic field. Okay? If you apply a magnetic field, electrons in your conduction band rotate one way. You know, electrons in your valence band rotate the other way around. Okay? This means that if you go into the quantum hole regime, okay, you will have edge modes in your conduction band that they will be you know chiral going in one direction. In your conduction band, it will kind of go in the opposite direction. Okay? Now, remember that graphene has several copies of this Dirac cone. Okay? Let me, for now, ignore the valley degree of freedom, the K and K prime. Let me just take the spin up and the spin down you know, parts of the Dirac cone. Ignore the valley for the moment. Okay? This means the following. If we apply now a Zeeman field, okay, so an in-plane magnetic field, Due to the similar effect, these Dirac cones will shift. You know, spin down will shift up, spin up, Dirac cone will shift down. So you will have a charge neutrality. If you keep your chemical potential at charge neutrality, you will have opposite spins with opposite chiralities coexisting in the system. Yeah? 
This is something that was early on, you know, theoretically uh, pointed out by, by Levitov and co-workers and also by Louis Ray and Fertig. So this means the following. If you now have your chemical potential there at charge neutrality, the spin-up part, when you enter the quantum hole regime, if you apply also some perpendicular magnetic field in addition to Zeeman, is going to give you this chiral edge state going in this direction. Okay? The spin down portion is going to give you a spin down going in the opposite direction. But this is in the exact same graphene sheet. So this is happening at the same time. Okay? This means that you are going to have coexisting helical edge states, spin up going clockwise, spin down going counterclockwise. Okay? This is something that you know, you've realized a you know, Zeeman plus quantum hole physics gives you a quantum spin hole at charge neutrality in graphene. Okay? Helical edge states with opposite spin polarization. Now, this is not under time reversal symmetry conditions because we're applying a magnetic field. You still get a quantum spin hole state. Yeah? For this, you need a, you know, so this is a 2D topological insulated magnetic field for which you also need electron electron interactions. It turns out that value degree of freedom that I decided to ignore plays an important role in the quantum hole physics of the system. So you can actually realize this, okay? The only problem is that you need very large in-plane magnetic fields of the order of 30 Tesla and beyond. Yep? Um, are the edge states uh, topolo topologically protected? They are topologically protected, okay? okay? But the protection, the, topolo you know, the symmetry that is protecting you is not time reversal symmetry, as in the quantum spin hole state. It's actually, a, you know, it's a bit fancy, but it's a U1 spin rotation symmetry. Basically. The direction of the magnetic field, all the spins are pointing in that direction or against that direction, and that is protecting you. The fact that you can rotate around that axis yeah. and nothing happens. This is the missing variant. OK, so I can also not scatter from one mode into the other. Indeed. OK. Yeah. There was another question here? All clear? OK. So we did this uh, by now a number of years ago, okay, together with Andrea Young and my colleague, Ray Ashuri. So if you measure the conductance versus gate voltage, okay, charge neutrality happens to be here in the middle okay, of a graphene in the presence of a perpendicular magnetic field. As we increase the parallel magnetic field, okay, at zero parallel magnetic field but high perpendicular field, this system is a trivial insulator. Okay? And as you increase the parallel magnetic field, the conductance increases and it gets very close to 2e squared over h. Okay? So you actually have crossing of helical edge states at the edge, okay? This was also done on A.B. bernal stack bilayer graphene by the group of Philip Kim with similar data. Okay? So that was one way of realizing this quantum spin hole state. It turns out that there's another way, you know, this thing is a little bit of a pain because you have to put 30 Tesla in plane, okay? This 35 Tesla actually for this upper trace here. It turns out you can also do this if you put twisted Graphene on top of graphene. Now, this is not magic angle graphene physics. Now, I'm choosing a very large angle between two graphene sheets. Okay? It turns out that if you put graphene on top of graphene okay, with a very large twist angle, the Dirac cones are very spaced apart in momentum space. The electronic states have very little coupling. And just with a purely perpendicular magnetic field, no large in-plane magnetic field, with a small perpendicular magnetic field, you can create Spin polarized, quantum hole, whoop, spin polarized quantum hole edge states in one layer and opposite in the other layer. You just need to apply an electric field so that you put electrons in one layer and holes in the other layer. Okay? So rather than before in graphene having to have electrons and holes in the same system, you split them between the two layers. And now with a purely perpendicular field, you can create spin polarized you know, quantum hole edge states that counter propagate in the two layers. Okay? So this is, you know, this is shown here. I'm just going quickly because this is not the main subject of the talk, but just to give you flavor for the type of things that we can do also uh, related to topology and, and quantum hole physics in this graphene system. So, how do you know the spin So there have been previous, many, many previous studies that have shown that if you take monolayer graphene and you apply of order a few Tesla, okay, you have broken symmetry states, you know, purely spin polarized at filling factor one and minus one, okay? With opposite spin polarization for one and minus one. And that's what we're doing. We're putting filling factor one here, minus one here. So we have opposite spin polarizations, yeah? Now, the advantage of this 
twisted bilayer system is that you can also measure fractional quantum hole effect in this twisted bilayer system, okay, at relatively modest magnetic fields. These are data at uh, six Tesla, okay, where you can see that you can put different fractions in one layer or the other and walk your way towards a fractional quantum spin hole type of effect. Okay, we didn't quite measure in this paper fractional quantum spin hole effect yet, but uh, you know, we're, we're making our way. Now here I want to tell you something. When we, you know, we, so we submitted this paper and it got accepted in Nature Nano, and my students who were very enthusiastic said, "Pablo, let's go for the cover." You know, now I've submitted many times covers for these fancy journals and never got any. I hired designers, paid money, nothing. You know, so I told my students, "Look, this is anyway so esoteric, you know, fractional quantum hole, quantum spin hole, twisted. No one's gonna give us the cover." So we're not spending any money on this. Then they begged me, no, oh, let's hire the designer. Nope. So they just decided to take the raw data for the cover, OK? <laughs> we didn't even submit it. They just took it, you know? Now, if you notice, they removed the noise. You know, this is real data. <laughs> this is the cover. They, you know, the noise looked ugly, so they yeah, removed it, you know? But other than that, you know, we were very happy. You know, for once, you know, my only cover, and it was free, you know, for once, you know. So that was good. So now, with that uh, detour, let me continue. So, you know, so we did all this work, and there would still be some purists that would come and say, like, ah, no time reversal symmetry. That's not real quantum spin hole, you know. OK, what can we do? Well, we can look at other 2D materials, OK? Now, in order to do, you know, graphene is a bit special. Because you can go work with graphene in your kitchen, and everything is perfect, nice. All these magic angle samples, we made them in atmospheric conditions, no clean room, no nothing, OK? Very robust. However, if you work with other two-dimensional materials, the environment turns out to be very critical. When you isolate them to monolayer form, most 99% of 2D materials degrade instantaneously. So a major breakthrough happened in my lab you know, and the breakthrough originated with taking some risks. So this is a lesson for all the young people, take risks. In my case, the risk was hiring a chemist, you know. So my lab is a pretty hardcore physics group, and a, a chemistry postdoc applied to it. I was like, hmm, chemistry, you know, should I? And then I thought, nah, let's hire a chemist. Let's see what he can do in the lab. And this chemist set up, you know, did many things in the lab, set up a glove boxes, Sorry, a furnace so that we can grow our own materials, and we've been growing some of our own materials since then. And especially, he set up a double glove box where we could now isolate basically any 3D layer material. We could now exfoliate it and isolate it in monolayer form. And there are thousands of 3D materials. So by now, you know, more than 50% of my group works on other materials than graphene, which we can now isolate in monolayer form. So this was actually a huge investment which paid off big time. Now. Among the materials that we started to work with were transition metal dicalcogenides, and in particular tungsten ditelluride. This was mentioned by Claudia, I think, yesterday. So most transition metal dicalcogenides, uh, you know, or, or many transition metal dicalcogenides, the most famous that people have been studying the most are three-dimensional semiconductors. And they crystallize in the 2H form. Okay, these are semiconductors, and it's the thermodynamic ground state for molybdenum disulfide, molybdenum diselenide, tungsten disulfide. Engineers are very interested because you can, you know, these are regular semiconductors. You can make regular transistors, 2D, transparent, LEDs, all kinds of things. And there have been thousands of people working on them since the first isolation of molybdisulfide in, in 2010. There is another polytype which is much more interesting for physics, or, or uh, uh, at least for certain aspects of physics, and this is. The 1T prime, TD, there are different versions. They all have a T, all those versions, OK? T prime, T, TD. This is not the thermodynamic ground state for most materials, except for WT2. WT2, if you grow a crystal thermodynamically, it wants to grow in this phase. So it's very nice. Okay? So this is a layer material. This is a crystal, OK? You can see right away, this is a microscopic picture of a crystal that it's layered. So, so it's 2D, but a little bit 1D-like. OK? So this is TDWT2. And we first became interested in this material uh, when uh, a very interesting paper by, by Fuan Ong at Princeton uh, showed that this material exhibits, you know, it's a bulk semi-metal 
with an extremely large magnetic resistance. Yeah? So you, 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 know, you increase the magnetic field, and the resistance changes by many orders of magnitude. Okay? The magnetic resistance here is 10 million percent, yeah? up to high magnetic fields. Now, back then, it wasn't completely clear why this was the case. Okay? And one of the options was that, because this is a semi-metal, it turns out that if you have equal, in a material equal amounts of electrons and equal amounts of holes, compensated electron holes, you can actually, this can lead to an extremely large magnetic resistance. And this was one of the hypotheses, but you know, people weren't clear. Some other people did experiments that showed that this was not the case, and there was some debate. So what we did is we exfoliated some devices, and we chose tri-layer WTE2. I'll tell you in a moment why tri-layer. Okay? This happens to be also semi-metal, but it's thin enough that you can change the density of electrons by making a field effect transistor geometry similar to the other devices that I described. So what we did is we measured the magnetic resistance, okay, as a function of, in this case now it's a 10 volts gate voltage. Here you have a very large magnetic resistance, okay, almost quadratic. This is what you expect for nearly compensated electron hole populations with similar mobility. However, now we can change the gate voltage, which means density, and therefore affect the relative amount of electrons and holes in the system. So we can decrease the number, you know, decrease the charge carrier population for one of them. You see, it starts to saturate. If we eliminate one of the carriers, we only have the other carrier, then we have a flat magnet resistance, as it is expected for a single population charge carrier. Okay? So this experiment demonstrated that indeed it is the nearly compensation of electrons and holes in the system responsible for this unsaturating magnet resistance. You change this balance and the system, you know, the magnet resistance decreases or disappears altogether. Yeah? Now, this material WT2 is, is, you know, turned out to be much more interesting than just exhibiting magnet resistance. It's a the prediction, the theoretical prediction is that it's a type two bulk semi-metal in the bulk. Okay? So there was theory and several experiments. Then my colleague Liam Fu, together with collaborators at MIT, predicted that these transition metal dicalcogenides in monolayer form in the T structure, okay, actually the prediction was for T prime, not for T D, they would be topological objects. Okay? In particular, they would be either topological semi-metals or topological insulators, two-dimensional, you know, so quantum spin hole insulators, depending on which material. Okay? More refined calculations show that indeed for TDWT2, if you get one layer, you would have a huge band gap, but actually uh, inverted, so it would be a topological insulator with a large band gap. For two layers, this is completely clear. It seems like it's an insulator with a small band gap, but the trivial insulator, three layers and beyond is a topological semi-metal, okay? That's why, you know, part of the reason why we chose three layers for that previous experiment. But then we started to look at one and two layers. Okay? So experiments, a little bit before our experiments, showed already that if you take monolayer WT2, it has a bulk gap, you know, there were STM, ARPES, and transport experiments. The STM and the ARPES experiments show that you have a monolayer has a bulk gap, and transport experiments showed that there was edge transport. It was not quantized, but there was already edge transport. Bulk is insulator, and there's transport at the edge. Okay? Now, the question is, are those edge states trivial, or are they topological, or what are they? So we set out to do our experiments. Okay? So let me show you already some data. If you measure the conductance, four probe conductance of monolayer WT2 versus gate voltage, okay? you have when the chemical potential is in your conduction band, you have you know, large conductance. In the balance band, large conductance. In between, you have this plateau, and this plateau is not at zero. This is like a semiconductor curve, except that in regular semiconductors, this goes to zero and then comes back up if you have an ambipolar semiconductor. This thing saturates at a finite value. That residual conductance comes from edge modes, and it was you know, similarly seen by this group. So then we decided, you know, to do a little bit more of a special measurement to probe exactly that edge mode, you know, on the conductance there. What we did is we made the following sample design, okay? So it's a little bit complicated. Let me guide you through it. This red thing, the pink thing, is monolayer WTE2. 
it has at the top and at the bottom hexagonal boronite to protect it. Turns out this material is extremely sensitive. So we have to passivate, I mean, protect it, cap it, bottom and top with hexagonal boronitride. Now, we do have these yellow contacts, are contacts that are making direct contact to the monolayer WTE2. Yeah? Then we have other metallic electrodes. There is a global graphite electrode. Okay? This is a gate that can change the density of electrons everywhere at the same time in the WTE2. And then we have narrow electrodes underneath the boron nitride. These are local gates which have different lengths and they can locally change the chemical potential in the W2 in different regions, okay? By applying a voltage to the different gates. So now, let me show you the experiment that we did. What we did is we measured the resistance, okay? Between these two, you know, elect between electrodes here and here, okay? And we did this as a function of gate voltage applied to whatever gate we wanted to choose, okay, which have different lengths. So initially, we apply a voltage to this graphite gate so that everything is highly doped. Okay? The chemical potential is in the conduction band or in the valence band of the entire device. Okay? If you measure the resistance versus gate voltage, that local gate voltage then, initially, this conducts very well, this has relatively little resistance. Then we vary the local gate voltage and we see a resistance jump. And the value of that resistance jump is h over two e squared, okay? This is happening because now we're tuning the chemical potential in that local region into the bulk gap to your conductance through the edge, through the helical edge states. So you can do that for a variety of, you know, devices and of different lengths, and then check how is all this working. And we always see the step of magnitude, you know, the magnitude of the step is H of, you know, about H over two square. As you know, for quantum spin hole, things are not very well quantized, okay? Now, this is very similar. This is, you know, more or less the same thing. This is a famous Mollenkamp paper. They also see a step, you know, H over two square, okay? So this is a good indication that we, you know, that and uh, WTE2 is a two-dimensional quantum spin hole insulator, but we wanted to go a little bit beyond, okay? So the first thing that we did is, okay, maybe we were very lucky. We just chose a length that happens to have a resistance. You know, you can take a piece of copper and choose the appropriate length to have, you know, two square over H conductance, okay? So it's good to vary the length and see if it stays two square over H or if it is, you were lucky with the device that you chose. Okay. So we did a length dependence study. Yeah? So we look at the height of this step you know, as a function of length, and this is in log scale, in log scale. And what we see is that for very long devices, the step, the resistance step, is actually higher than h over 2 squared, but as you go towards shorter and shorter lengths, it seems to saturate, and more importantly, not go to the other side of this line, of this red line. Okay? Amazingly, this type of length dependence study has not been done for other quantum spin hole insulators. I don't know why. I am aware of this study in the indium arsenide, gallium and timonite. It's also a 2D topological insulator, except that you can also grow it in the trivial phase. And there was a study by, by Charlie Marcus and Leo Kamuhoven on the trivial phase, and they showed that this step in resistance can shoot all the way through h over 2 squared. So basically, you can, you know, this doesn't saturate because this edge state is trivial. You can choose any length of your resistor and you will get any value of resistance accordingly, okay? But this has not been done for other uh, 2D quantum spin hole insulators. So that's one thing that we wanted to check and indeed it seems that it saturates. <coughs> the resistance doesn't become smaller than two, you know, h over 2 squared, that step. Now, the other thing that we did is we sat at this plateau Okay, so I'm going to show now a zoom in, in gate voltage on the plateau here, and we decided to apply a magnetic field. As you know, two-dimensional time reversal invariant topological insulators, if you apply a magnetic field, you kill the topological protection. So your conductance should decrease, or your resistance should increase, okay? So 
If you look at the conductance at the plateau, okay, and this is in log scale, the upper plateau in gate voltages, so the, the, this blue trace is the plateau at zero magnetic field, which is at two is square over eight, very close to two is square over h. Okay? Then you apply a magnetic field, and what you can see is that everywhere the conductance decreases, but there's one region in gate voltage where the conductance decreases a lot. In fact, it decreases exponentially. Okay? So again, if you, you, know, you can plot this thing, this is conductance as a function of magnetic field, you can see that in this region, this corresponds to this trace, the conductance decreases exponentially. Okay? In other regions, the conductance is suppressed, but not exponentially. This makes sense. Okay? In this region of the plateau, your chemical potential is always in the bulk gap, but you're exploring the Dirac cone of the edge states. Okay? If your chemical potential is not right at the Dirac point, even though you open a gap, you don't suppress exponentially the conductance. You you, you break the topological protection and you are allowed some backscattering, but your chemical potential is still there. So you still have a finite conductance. So you only suppress it a little bit, not exponentially. But if your chemical potential is right at the Dirac point, now your gap opens and your conductance is suppressed exponentially. Yeah. Yes, it's here. Yes, exactly. So the thing that we can do now is, okay, you can take this trace and now look at the temperature dependence. This is the temperature dependence. Okay? Turns out you can collapse all these curves by looking at the log of the conductance versus mu b over k b t. All of the curves collapse into a single curve that gives you what is the g factor for the edge states of the topological insulator, okay? which in this case it happens to be about five, the g factor for the edge states, for the one dimensional edge states. So again, this is something that somewhat surprisingly, you know did not show up in other topological, 2D topological insulators. If you look at mercury telluride, for example, an application of a magnetic field kills the conductance, but look at the starting point. The starting point is 0.14 is square over h, not 2 is square over h. If you look at samples that start at 2, close to 2, 1.7, 1.8, the conductance becomes 2, becomes better quantized. It doesn't disappear. Yeah? In strain in the arsenide ganum and timonite, the resistance increases by a little bit, but maybe 50 percent, but it doesn't get killed exponentially. Okay? So I think I'm not sure there is a very good understanding yet of why in these other two-dimensional topological insulators it doesn't happen. I think in mercury telluride, the direct point is actually below the bulk bands. So even you, you open a gap at the direct point, you're actually not able to see the exponential suppression of the conductance because it's buried underneath the bulk bands. But in the system, because the gap is so large for mercury telluride and for WT2. We have the complete Dirac cone exposed, and we can open the gap and see it there. So the last thing that I want to mention about mercury telluride is that, uh, sorry, about WT2, is that this conductance of 2 square over h for the plateau is surprisingly robust, or maybe not so surprisingly, because we know that the gap was pretty large. So it survives up to about 100 Kelvin, okay, that, that quantization, okay, which is much larger than in other systems which have much smaller you know, inverted band gaps. So overall, you know, we think that this platform is, is a very promising platform to, to investigate further, you know, topological effects in two dimensions. The, the only problem that we're struggling with, which is a big problem, is that it's extremely fragile, the system. It's very sensitive to contamination, so it's very hard to do fabrication and processing. So we're progressing, but slowly, in, in, in continuing to investigate this material. Let me now tell you, you know, so I'll tell you a bit about this piece of engineering topological systems with, you know, topological physics with Vanevarsk heterostructures. Let me tell you a little bit about layered superconductors. Yeah? So there are many superconductors which are layered. Cuprates are layered. Nyron disul disulinide is layered. Tantalum disulfide is layered. Okay? And when you study them in ultra-thin format, they sometimes have, you know, give you surprises. So for example, nyron selenide is actually, nyron selenide is a regular superconductor in the sense that, I mean, it's a little bit exotic, but if you make your nylon selenide and you cool it down, you get a superconductor. If you make it ultra thin, TC decreases. That's usually what happens with most superconductors. Not all, but most superconductors. As you take a bulk superconductor and you make it smaller, your Cooper pairs run out of space to become Cooper pairs and TC decreases, okay? 
that happens with most superconductors. It also happens with nylon diselenide, for example. This is regular nylon diselenide has a TC of 7 Kelvin. Bilayer nylon selenide has a TC of 5 Kelvin. If you go to monolayer, it's about 3 Kelvin. Yeah? So TC goes down with layer number. You can, on the other hand, have systems like 2H tantalon disulfide. The bulk TC is 0.8 Kelvin, but if you make a three layer device, TC is 2.5 Kelvin. If you make two layer device, TC is 3 Kelvin. Monolayer is about 3.5 Kelvin. So TC nearly quadruples as you make it thinner. Okay? And this is something that is very special. Here I have this you know, comparison between data you know, published, uh, I think this is Kim Max group, on, or, or Abhaypasupathy, on 2H9 selenide from monolayer to the bulk TC increases. In our data on 2H tantalum disulfide is the opposite, from monolayer to the bulk TC decreases, or from bulk to monolayer TC increases. Okay? So these two dimensional superconductors are, yep? Yeah. So, as you can see here, it doesn't matter where you count this. TC is obviously higher for, you know, seven layers than for bulk and higher for tri-layer than, as you get to monolayer and so on, they broaden and we're taking TC onset, okay? But indeed, you can argue, but the overall evolution is clear. Yeah? Also similar in this case. These are well separated curves. They always, always broaden when you get to monolayer, yeah. Now, these two-dimensional superconductors, as I mentioned also for magic angle graphene, have also another property, and it is that you can apply huge in-plane magnetic fields. Yeah? In the case of the 2H transi uh, transition metal like algogenides, okay, what happens is that there is this thing called icing superconductivity. There is a huge spin orbit coupling which locks, could prepares like this. So even if you apply a huge in-plane magnetic field, you're not destroying the could prepare because the spin orbit coupling field Okay, it's locking your group repairs like this. You have different spin orbit coupling in one valley or the other. And as a result, you can violate the Pauli limit by a factor of many, okay? And apply huge in plane magnetic fields uh, without destroying superconductivity. And that can be quite useful for some topological uh, devices. Let me come back to WTE2, okay? So the, I've shown before this, this curve of Conductance you know, versus gate voltage. Oops, sorry, this is running a little bit crazy. Conductance versus gate voltage. Yeah? I've focused before on the quantum spin hole insulator behavior here. Now, this curve was taken at 4 Kelvin. Turns out, if you park your chemical potential here in the metallic regime and now you cool down, yeah, this is what happens. Your resistance drops very rapidly below a certain temperature. These were data in that complicated device geometry that I showed before to do length dependence, so it has a serious resistance, which is saturating there. Okay. But already from nonlinear IB characteristics, we suspect that this actually is becoming a superconductor. So what we did is we made four terminal devices, okay, and now we see proper resistance curves going to zero. It turns out WTE2 is a quantum spin hole insulator when your Fermi energy is a charge neutrality, but if you dope it, it becomes a superconductor, okay? And this work was actually published you know, at the same time as the Falk and Cobden groups, so immediately other groups reproduced the exact same results. Now, it is an electrically tunable superconductor to quantum spin hole insulator system, okay? These curves are at different gate voltages. You go from a superconductor to an insulator, which actually, when you look at small devices, happens to be a quantum spin hole insulator. Now, you can you know, apply magnetic field and so on. Let me just go to this phase diagram. Okay. So it's very funny. The, we were doing this also in 2018, right? If you look, we're varying the gate voltage just with electrically, you know, just regular gate voltage with the standard dielectric. So this, for a while, for a brief period, this was the lowest charge density superconductor in the world. 5, 10 to the 12 electrons per square centimeter, or one of the lowest. You know, there are a couple others competing there. At the same time, my other students in the group were doing magic angle graphene, 
which happens to superconduct at 10 to the 11. So only, you know, we held the world record WT2 for my, no, that group of students for a few weeks until magic and graphene came and superconducted by, you know, less than an order of magnitude, you know, more than an order of magnitude less charge density. But anyway, it's also an extremely low density superconductor. It may be a very special type of superconductor. So this is the overall phase diagram. You know, you have quantum spin hole insulator near charge neutrality up to something like order 100 Kelvin. You have a, when you dope it, it becomes a metal, and then a superconductor with an electrically tunable superconductivity with a maximum TC of order one Kelvin. And many groups are investigating you know, this behavior. Other topological insulators, such as vitamin selenide, when you dope them, they become topological superconductors with a knock here. Yep. Did you notice that there is a fuzzy boundary here? It's on purpose. We are not sure if there's a quantum critical point there separating quantum spin hole from superconductor, or there is a metallic region in between. We don't know. Yeah, that, that, that fuzzy blurry boundary is on purpose <laughs> in the color scale. So let me now go to this part of this talk. Now, for a while, we've been having a lot of fun you know, with 2D materials, and we've been exploring you know, first graphene, then other topological materials such as WT2. We also have insulators like HVN, semiconductors like the 2H MOS2, WAC2. We even have uh, superconductors, nylon selenite, tantalum disulfide, the cuprates, which we've all isolated them in monolayer form. Yes? Mm -hmm. Compared to bilayer, what, WT2? Oh, to twisted bilayer. Um, it's, you know, TC is quite different, so I would have to compare traces for same TC. Um, right now, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. WT2 is more susceptible to disorder, so if I had to guess now, I think it's a bit broader, WT2, but I would have to look at the data in detail. We, I don't know if you noticed, but we also see a suspicious step. We thought it was disorder, but many you know, other groups also see this suspicious step here. In twisted bilayer, it's relatively broad, yes. It's more 2D than this. This is, this is three atomic planes <laughs> instead of two. <laughs> so, okay, so let me go to, to this. You know, so we're having a lot of fun with 2D materials, and. Up until a couple of years ago, there was a, a big obvious hole in the condensed matter behavior of 2D crystalline materials, which is, is well, where are the magnets, okay? We have all the behaviors almost in 2D materials. What about magnets, yeah? Now, this is not to say that two-dimensional magnetism you know, didn't exist. It has a long history in metallic thin films and super lattices, in dilute magnetic semiconductors, in polymers, but there was no isolated, you know, monolayer crystalline material with intrinsic magnetism that you could hang in your, your kitchen or something like that. Yeah? So this was, you know, this, this, this Van der Waals type of magnets, I think they offer a unique scenario both for fundamental, you know, two-dimensional magnetism physics and also for devices, okay? So first of all, if you can make single unit cell magnets, that will be true to the limit. They will be atomically flat, crystalline, there may be layer-dependent type of magnetism in the system, and because they are van der Waals systems, there's very weak interaction with the substrate. In many other systems, it's the interaction with the substrate that dependent, you know, makes the magnetism present or absent. For devices, you can use them for topological superconductivity, for various types of spintronics, et cetera. So there's, there's, I think, strong motivation, both fundamental and applied. Now, this didn't go completely unnoticed, and you know, many people were you know, trying to study, okay, what type of you know, two-dimensional magnets out of three-dimensional layer magnets we could have. And it seemed like, you know, many, many of the studies seem to coalesce around the chromium trihalides, chromium triiodide, chromium tribromide, chromium trichloride, and also chromium XT tellurium-3, where X is silicon or germanium. You know, plenty of studies uh, seem to coalesce about this. So we decided to grow in my group, okay, in this, you know, with this chemist and this ovens that he set up, we decided to grow chromium triiodide, okay? It's a material which was studied in the 60s, then forgotten for 40 years and then, or 50 years, and then rediscovered a few years ago, sort of, the interest in it. It's a layered ferromagnetic insulator, okay? So it's a ferromagnet insulator, okay? There are not so many of those, 
<laughs> it's an insulator, not a metal. And yeah, there was this paper again in the 60s which characterized some of it. The T, the Curie temperature of the, ferro, of the bulk ferromagnet is 61 Kelvin. It has kind of icing anisotropy, of a few hundred microvolts per chromium atom. Yeah, and the magnetic moments point perpendicular to the layers. That's also kind of unusual, okay, for layer system. It is more or less, you know, it's an insulator, uh, you know, with a, with a gap. I shouldn't put really gap, band gap. It's a, actually a gap of about 1.5 eb, and it has low cleavage energy, which means you can exfoliate it. These are crystals that we grew. You can exfoliate it. This is a thin one. Okay. If you take a crystal and you measure the magnetization, you see a standard behavior for a magnet. Yeah. Now. We can exfoliate it in our glove box. It turns out to be also extremely sensitive to atmospheric conditions, so we have to work in a glove box. This is a flake that we exfoliated. We chose on purpose this flake because it shows different layer numbers, one, two, three, four, five layers. Okay? Turns out, as you can see here, the optical contrast tells you directly how many layers you have. Okay? We separately do atomic force microscopy, Raman, and a number of things, but by eye, you can pretty much tell, especially with a 2D group you know, used to graphene, et cetera, right away you can tell how many layers you have. So we decided to study the magnetism, and for that we used this technique in collaboration with the Shao Shu group at the University of Washington in Seattle. We did magneto-optical curve effect. Yeah? So what this means is you send linearly polarized light to your sample, and you look at the reflected light. Yeah? If the reflected light is, has a polarization rotated, that tells you right away that you had magnetism in the sample, okay? It's a very standard method. So for example, if you take a bulk crystal, a, a thin bulk crystal, and you look at the curve rotation signal versus magnetic field, you see this hysteresis loop. When you see that hysteresis, you know unambiguously the system is magnetic, yeah? ferromagnetic in particular, not magnetic, ferromagnetic. So what we did is, you know, we exfoliated a monolayer flake, and you measured the curve rotation intensity this is spatially, this is X, Y image, yeah? and you see a signal, so we knew right away that this was ferromagnetic. You do magnetic field dependence, and you can see that this is a hard ferromagnet you know, with a finite you know, coercive field and a finite magnetization at zero field. Yeah? Now, in particular, the way we measure Mach in this perpendicular geometry, this tells us also that there's an icing ferromagnet. Okay? The magnetization is out of plane, even though this is a monolayer magnet. Most of the thin magnets have the magnetization in plane. This is out of plane. And as we reverse the magnetic field, we can look also at the presence of domains, magnetic domains. Here we, you know, we're just cooling at zero Tesla. The magnetization is spontaneously is in one direction. We now reverse, you know, increase the magnetic field in the opposite direction, and we see that this sample contains two domains. First one flips, this one flips first, and then the whole sample flips. Okay, and we see the magnetic domains. So I should mention that our work you know, was published simultaneously back to back with uh, work in a collaboration between Berkeley, UC Irvine, and, and some other place, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting, uh, on few layer chromium germanium telluride. Okay? They were able to go down to two layers. Okay? Now, as it's often the case, we found an interesting surprise with the system. Okay? So the bulk is a ferromagnet, all of the layers are ferromagnetically aligned. A monolayer is a ferromagnet, so you might expect two layers should be a ferromagnet, but it's not the case. Okay, so this is the signal for monolayer. You see, hysteresis loop, hard gap. We measured bilayer, and to our surprise, bilayer does not have a hysteresis loop at zero magnetic field. Turns out, bilayer chromium triiodide is each layer is ferromagnetically aligned but they are anti-aligned with respect to each other. So it's an interlayer anti-ferromagnet. Yeah? If you apply enough magnetic field, you flip one of the layers. So you have a metamagnetic transition at a finite magnetic field. OK, so guess trilayer. What will it be? Well, trilayer happens to be a ferromagnet because now you have an old layer. Yeah? But we could check that in this A, in reality, it's an anti-ferromagnet, but because you have three layers, the net result is a ferromagnet. Okay? I'm not showing the data here, but if you extend a little bit the magnetic field, you have another step, which is when you polarize the three layers in the same direction in a metamagnetic transition. Yep? Uh, 
So in principle, OK, this, you're right that the, the magnitude of the kernel rotation you know, does not depend necessarily on the number of layers. OK? So we're not exactly sure why, but you know, stronger rotation seems to indicate a stronger ferromagnet, and that could be the case. But in order to go from here to magnetization, you need input from theory on, 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 on you know, various parameters for the magnetism. And theories have not yet told us what those parameters are. So we cannot do a one-to-one -one map. There are issues of reflection. Three layers reflect more than one. Uh, well, actually, the reflection would only be intensity, not rotation. But you know, there are some issues there which we haven't been able to yet calculate. So with this, you know, this was sort of the beginning of, of 2D ferromagnets. I have to say I, I don't have uh, more slides on this. But since we published this in, in 2017, by now there are more than a dozen two-dimensional ferromagnets. They're also very interesting anti-ferromagnets. You can make very interesting heterostructures, twisted heterostructures, etc. So it's also a field which is growing, you know, exponentially, and, and you know, it's, it's it's becoming very interesting. So just to finalize, you know, we have all the basic ingredients of, you know, with 2D materials to try to engineer topological physics by combining them. Combining them is a lot more challenging than, than, than studying each piece individually, but you know, I think there's a good hope that, that we will be able to, to at least some of the effects engineer them. And with this, I want to thank um, the group members that you know, were responsible for this part of the work, which included all of these people, including very strong collaborations with Bob Kaba, Shadon Shu, and David Cobden, Di Chao, Wang Yao at Hong Kong, Michael McGuire, and our Japanese growers. And I want to thank you for your attention. No, no, we have a lot of problems, believe me. So <laughs> let me tell you. I show the temperature dependence. The quantization stays at you know, very close to 2 square over h over a large temperature range, up to about 100 Kelvin. Yeah? Now, that is indeed much better or, or to much larger temperature than the mercury telluride. But if you look at the length dependence, yeah, our length dependence data, the conductance saturates to about 2 square over h below about 100 nanometers. We cannot make a micron, let alone 10 micron long device, and see this quantization. Okay? So we're also suffering from you know, not such good protection. Something is backscattering our electrons on you know, longer length scales of, of, of 100 or a, few, a couple hundred nanometers. Okay? In mercury telluride, although I do not, I'm not aware of length dependence data, for the lengths that they show, the one or two lengths that they show, they have at least a, over a micron or so the quantization is similar to us. You know, I think we're a little bit closer to two, but very similar. Yeah? So I do think that you know, they have all kinds of problems, but still the mercury telluride edges have higher quality than the WT2 edges. They have in scanning probe microscopy, in particular scanning microwave impedance microscopy experiments by Cobden together with uh, CX Shen and other groups. And they have shown that WT2 is very fragile. When you exfoliate it, unless you're very careful, or even if you're very careful, often you have cracks at the edges that penetrate deep into the sample. Okay? So, for, so for some of the data where I show length dependence, it could be that that length was in reality not 300 nanometers as I thought, but it was micron and then back. So much longer effectively. And that's why the resistance increases. So. This is something that, you know, it's a materials issue. We have to be more careful with exfoliation and try to make better devices. So one thing is not related to the other. You know, you can have a 100 nanometer segment without any cracks or imperfections. And there, when you do temperature dependence, you know, your gap is very large. So you're perfectly fine. But that's not the same type of, of, of protection or robustness than you know, having length dependence and maybe having 
crap at the edges or cracks or things like that, you know, that will give you backscattering. I, I don't know, okay? So I don't think it's very well understood either in, in Mercury Telluride. Okay, there, there are all kinds of proposals from interacting electrons, you know, in, in quantum dots nearby the edges to magnetic impurities, you know, but I don't have a good you know, understanding of that. No, I'm not aware of any such studies. As I mentioned, this is extremely susceptible to contamination, this material in monolayer form. I cannot make a device and send it to an STM person to look at it, because for STM you need exposure, okay? The best I think that people could do is grow it by MBE. Some people have been growing thin films of this thing, and then in situ in UHP transfer to an STM and look at it, but I'm, I'm not aware of such studies. I, I don't have a, you know, I, I, we can in principle make a tunnel junction, yeah, because it's gateable. We haven't done so, but we can. I'm aware of recent experiments by Mollenkamp on Mercury Telluride, making tunnel junctions, and claiming that there is a strong electron-electron interaction. I think the dielectric constant is much higher in Mercury Telluride. It's actually very high, 80 or something like that. Done in, yeah. So screening should be much stronger there. Yep. Yep, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's, it's easy to do. You know, we, we make those local gates that I showed for the study of the gate dependence. Those local gates could have a little gap and make a quantum point contact like defining uh, WT2. It's very much possible. We haven't done it, but it's very much possible. Yeah. <laughs> One more question. No problem. Mm -hmm. We could, in principle, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not very persuaded by those type of experiments. I've worked on carbon nanotubes before, where many similar experiments were done, and people attributed, in some cases, the power loss to, you can see, when you, when you look at the data, and I've done a lot of those experiments, you can see all kinds of power loss, and there are many things that can modify the power loss that you see, depending on sample measurement, geometry, environment. So. I'm not sure that that is a determining proof of, of Lattinger liquid behavior, but, but it's worth investigating. Yeah. Uh, about what, sorry? Uh, phase transition in tungsten Phase transition in tungsten telluride. Between which phases? Yes, we just dial the gate voltage, okay? And then we see that it becomes a superconductor and the TC increases with gate voltage. We haven't been able to go all the way with the voltage to see if we have a dome or it just monotonically increases. That we don't know because we, we couldn't go beyond a certain gate voltage value, okay? Oh, we don't know, you know. It's, it's a system that, you know, there, there are many materials that, that when you dope them, they become superconductors, this is one of them. We do not know what is the nature of the superconductivity, the order parameter, etc. I can tell you, I think my, my students won't like it, but uh, I'll tell you anyway. We've tried to make Josephson junctions where, because you know, we can, again, locally control the chemical potential. So one of the things we wanted to do right away is something that you know, Charlie proposed a long time ago with Leanne, so, you know, make a superconductor quantum spin hole junction, except that now we can do it in the same, within the same material. We don't have to put an external superconductor on top of your quantum spin hole system. We can just gate locally here superconductor and gate locally here quantum spin hole. 
So we've tried to measure that sort of topological Johnson junction, you know, and we do not see the type of Fraunhofer pattern that we would expect from having proximitized edge states. Looked for it many devices. We've, we checked that in those devices you have quantum spin hole and superconductivity separately in the same device. We tune it to that regime. We don't see edge state Fraunhofer pattern. So we, we are quite frustrated until recently someone told me, you know what? If your superconductor is P wave, you will not see this Fraunhofer pattern because you will not be able to couple your spin up and spin down in your under reflection process, you know, on the edge states. So suddenly this, our frustration could be a very interesting thing, but you know, I don't know. We have to investigate, you know, to see if indeed, if this P wave, uh, uh, you would not be able to see that type of Fraunhofer pattern. Yeah, we have to see. Nobody knows what is the order parameter, but other dope topological isolators happen to be P wave. So who knows? Maybe it is P wave. Oh yeah, so I didn't speak about it, but there one T MOT two. So MOT two usually is two H, but you, it, but it, but you can quench the crystals, and it is in a metastable state. It you can make it, you know, you can grow it of the one T phase. That one, it's not clear if it's a quantum spin hole insulator. That part has not been studied that much, but in monolayer form, it is also a superconductor and with a much higher T C six Kelvin than this one, which is about one Kelvin. It's an electrically tunable superconductor. So right now we're also looking at one TMOT too, because it, it's either a topological semi-metal or a quantum spin hole insulator, and it is also a superconductor, so it's very interesting. Okay, if there's no further questions, then thanks, Pablo. <laughs>